Hello again, this is News Today. Now, the Bonapo Region Regional Security Council has issued a two-week ultimatum to members of the old Dokochina community near the Boy Hydroelectric Dam in the Bonapo Region to relocate or risk forceful eviction. The RECSEC chairman at a news conference in Sunyan said the council will deem it imperative to use the necessary force at its disposal to ensure that the dam and the generation station are preserved in the national interest Let's talk after your Juma sent in this report. Joy News first reported about the presence of the illegal miners at Old Dokuchina in the Banda district some months ago. The Bonafo Regional Security Council subsequently sent a fact finding team to the area on February 25 this year. Based on the report of the fact-finding team, REXEC, in consultation with the National Security Council, decided to drive the people out of the area. According to the regional minister, inhabitants of six villages in the catchment area of the dam were relocated by the Bui Power Authority in 2011 to pave way for the construction of the dam, but six households at Dokochina failed to relocate. Paul Evanseidu further stated that illegal mining and other illicit activities have taken center stage in some areas of the Bui National Park, including the fringes of the dam, which is believed to contain deposits of gold-bearing rocks. He mentioned illegal fishing, illegal and indiscriminate logging, as well as trading narcotics as a direct effect of the refusal by the people of Old Dokochina, led by one Edward Kujukuma, to be resettled. The regional minister consequently stressed that the unacceptable situation calls for immediate and decisive action by RECSEC in order to safeguard the priceless national asset from being destroyed by self-seekers. Contrary to the Sinyani High Court ruling, the staff in both teeth and the occupants of the state's houses have continued to reside at the Kutina. Furthermore, the unwillingness of the state's households to relocate has led to foreign nationals from neighboring countries, including Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, leaving China, invading the area with impunity. Reports indicate that the, lo the locals and the foreigners are engaged in all manners of illegal activities, such as illegal mining, illegal laboring, illegal fishing, narcotic drugs, prostitution, illegal trading in various currencies, and trading in general. Meanwhile, Joy News has learned that illegal mining is gradually spreading to other parts of the Bui National Park, which also needs immediate attention and protection. Nesta Kafuya Jumes reports for Joy News. Let's move on to health. And the World Health Organization says the Ebola outbreak in Guinea is very serious, but has not reached epidemic proportion. proportions. The latest WHO figures show 80 people have died among the 122 suspected cases of Ebola in Ghana. Here in Ghana, the Ministry of Health put in some measures at our borders to make sure Ebola does not get into the country. Let's go over to the telephone now and find out how far these measures I have yielded a resource. Thank you very much for joining us, Doc. Thank you. And good afternoon to you and to your viewers. Doc, we, 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 we put together a... The, the line is noisy. I don't get the message. Can there you is, hear me now? There is some interference <laughs> behind. I, I, I can I, get I'm, some words, yes. Right. I, 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 my first question, really, Doc, is the monitoring measures we put uh, together. What's the latest on them? No, no, I, I can't get... We'll, we'll uh, get back to uh, you then, Doc. Thank you very much. Well, let's move on to something else while we try and get the health, Ghana Health Service over the telephone. And, uh, well, the sole commissioner of the judgment debt, Justice Yawa Powell, has called for the separation of the Attorney General's Department from the Ministry of Justice. The commission has attributed some huge compensation paid to claimants to the failure of the AG's department to defend the state. Failure of state attorneys to appear in court to defend the state has been blamed for many of the judgment debt cases the commission has had. In many of the cases, the commission had the state attorney's failure to appear in court 
has led to the award of default judgments against the state, which also tend to accumulate interest because the state fails to pay over a long period. Justice Yawa Pao lamented the poor attitude of state attorneys. Yeah, I think it's very, very important because if the Attorney General is also a Minister of Justice and is always, you know, you know, very much involved in political issues, cabinet meetings, and leaves the, the, the legal matters to the Chief State Attorney State, they do their own thing. We should have an Attorney General who will be very serious with matters involving, you know, uh, uh, suits against the state. Because that's where all the monies are going to the drain. They don't have time to supervise the, the, the state attorneys who handle the cases in court. They take is there the solicitor general, the DPPs, when they distribute the cases, the lawyers don't go to court. That's all. Then default judgment. For several years back, cases involving government and the attorney general will not bother at all. Then when judgment is taken, and then the, the, the properties of the state, Bank of Ghana, are garnished, then you see them running, health care. His comments came on the back of a 254,643 Ghana CDs paid one Peter Aban during the construction of the Kanda Highway in 1993. I think it's high time the state took a second look at the caliber of lawyers that are recruited to the attorney general's office. It's serious. It's always default judgment. Default judgment. If state matters, you don't defend them. But if it is an individual matter, you rush to court. For years, it will be dragging on. But state or within MEMS close, the money paid. Then people will share. Counsel for the Commission, Dometi Kofi Sopo, also stressed Ghana will not lose huge sums to judgment debts if state attorneys were committed to challenging such claims. All that we have throughout these are sittings is that most of the time they do not go to court to uh, project the, 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 the feelings or interest of the states. If, if they had gone to defend, I mean these judgments wouldn't be given at all. In fact, if they are going to defend, there was the possibility that the other party would have lost because uh, the records that we have before us, most of them are cases, involve cases that could easily be defended and won. Yes, but because you are not there, and the judge will certainly uh, well, do what law, the law requires him to do for the party that is serious about his or her case that he has put before the court. The Attorney General's Department, Lands Commission and Urban Roads will later appear to assist the Commission in its investigations into that particular issue of Kanda Highway Compensations. Matilda Pomaga for Joy News, Accra. We'll discuss this further, but let's go back to our earlier health story on Ebola and what the Ghana uh, surveillance team has gathered so far. We're joined over the telephone by Dr. Bedou Sakode. He's head of disease surveillance at the Ghana Health Service. Thank you very much, Dr. Sakode, for joining us here on News Today. You're most welcome. All right. I'm glad you can hear me now. What have we observed yeah. so far at our, bo our borders? Um, our borders, for now, the, what we, uh, we, we, we put in place regarding the vigilance and surveillance at the borders is sensitization of the port health staff and the people that are working at the various points of entry that um, unlikely event that anybody is crossing our borders into the country they will pick it they will pick the, the, the case given having given them the definition of the case what how the case presents in the suspected and then the people coming out clearly with uh, florid symptoms and signs so sensitization to the staff there, which is key. I see. Hello. And th 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 let's come back to uh, the question itself. What form is this uh, monitoring taken? Because uh, someone could come into the country without necessarily having fever. The, 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 we have a system in place that's generally at acute viral hemorrhagic fever condition. And we made it very broad. Anybody with fever and bleeding tendencies suspect that 
situation and sustain the case. We, that is what we are using to monitor the situation at the community surveillance level, at the, uh, the facility surveillance, and the various surveillance systems through the district region and to the national level. So the case definition has been made very sensitive. A lot of cases might be tested to uh, fit the suspected case. You would take sample and uh, investigate. It might not be the case. That is very good. And if it happens to be one that's still trained through, the system will be sensitive to pick it. So the surveillance system is not looking only at the various uh, uh, points of entry or at the border point. Um, there was various uh, risk factors that are uh, prevalent at Guinea that led to the outbreak. All, most of these risk factors are here. So as much as possible, we should not over-concentrate efforts at the borders, but then look at the entire surveillance system in a holistic manner so that if it should happen that um, some animals must have been uh, infected and people come in contact with the animal, and then getting infected there, we will pick it earlier. The surveillance, not only in the human population, but then we are working closely with the game and wildlife that are also keeping vigilance. Uh, they have uh, staff and officers within the wildlife um, areas that we have these uh, animal species. And they'll be looking for sick animals. They'll be looking for uh, animals dropping dead and that is what we are watching. Right here, recently, I think the last two days or so, I think the message and the information and education that's being sent out is reaching the people and people are listening well. People have called twice that they've seen bats dropping dead. Immediately you follow up to those bats and then essentially they happen to not to be the type of bats that harbor the virus. So I'm happy the messages have been and the people are listening and listening well. So we keep some land in the human population, the animal population, within the general uh, public in the population mm. in general, and then the various points of entry being the border. I see. The, the so called here, here in Accra, we have our own share of bats in, in the capital city. And, yeah. and, 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 and so, what kind of bats are, is, the, is the virus harboring one? Um, the bats that we have mostly at tip seven are not the fruit eating bats that uh, harbor the virus. And indeed, prior to this, before this outbreak, uh, they had been worked by the wildlife and the veterinary with the health team looking at the various uh, virus and diseases that the bats at tip seven might be uh, holding. And it, was clear that they don't have the Ebola, but then there are other disease conditions that these bats do transmit. Uh, but for now, we are talking about Ebola. Mm. But regarding then, Ebola, then again, the, the bats at the seven don't have all. But, but then there are areas in the country, we mentioned the, the cave living bats at um, Brohavu area, a Boyam area. Those bats are the type which could harbor the, the virus. And uh, that's an area that um, we have to keep close eyes on. The staff there, we are designing strategies to uh, give good orientation to the staff at this area, also to give public education to make sure that people that come go to that area should um, 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 avoid contact, direct contact with the bus, and then also uh, the people will not let people. Uh, the, 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 the tourists that go to that area unduly have mm. contact with the bats. Let, let's, let, Dr. Zakode, let's try and yes. explain these strategies you have put in place. Because my concern is, I don't know how we can stop the bats that are flying from coming into our country. We, we may be able to do that at the borders. We may be able to do that uh, when we, we engage those in the wildlife. But... When it comes to bats who would migrate from Guinea, from, Sen from, from Senegal, how do we handle that? What is the strategy that you keep talking about, how you're designing some strategies to be able to contain this, to be able to make sure that we, we don't have Ebola coming into the country? You see, there are multiple agencies, and um, we, we have people that are experts 
in wildlife activity. People, so the multiple agencies, the, 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 the working groups that have been established in this context. And the cellular group, we have experts expert who are very good in wildlife activities to monitor the type of fire. They have a system to track, uh, the, they have tagged some of the bats with uh, film cutter. The, the bats here, if they get to Togo, there is a way to track that these are some of the bats coming from Togo, uh, the, the bats from other areas. So I see. Uh, the, the people are doing a lot of work on that. The game and wildlife, they have the expertise, knowledge to work on that, and they are tracking the movement of the bats. But the, the, other, Dr. Sakwari, uh, the difficulty is... The, 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 the difficulty here is uh, the inability to water down the strategy so that we, we can all feel safe, really, because uh, the, the first concern is the fact that these bats fly anyway. None of us human beings are able to fly. And so uh, if you could water down the strategy you're putting in place rather than the fact that these wild, wild, wildlife people have the expertise in doing this, we want more than just people who have the expertise. What is the game plan? The bats, the, the wildlife periodically uh, trap some of the bats and use protective method measures to assess whether these bats are harboring the virus. So with this sampling, if any of group of bats are infected, they will, they will be easily detected. And we all know that now the bats here are harboring the virus. So the bats at this area should be gunned down or should be, uh, well, should de design system to uh, flush them out. So the, that is what, uh, see, some of these things is quite technical if you have to explain to the general public. And the, what I can say is that the people are watching uh, well, uh, with closed eyes, looking at the presence of the virus within the bat population. If the bats are, are the other animals, for instance, the monkeys, when they get the infection, you get ill. So if the monkey drops dead, the game and wildlife will not just look at tickets and bury. You have to do, do autopsy mm. and find out the cause of death to assess whether it was Ebola virus infection that caused the death. And then after, then the next step of measures will follow. Right. And no. these are the things that you have. It's quite technical, and it will not be easy to okay. But explaining it down, water, turn it down, it's, it's possible. But then I think just to say that the people are all the studies are watching. I believe it's enough, and they are watching because when it comes to the point that they say that these are the caves, we have identified them to be infected. Nobody should go there. Then they will. You advise the authorities to act in that line. But for now, we haven't gone there yet. So let's continue monitoring. Is there the need to come out of stringent measures that will be advised the authorities accordingly and let them go that, to that uh, extent? We'll leave it here for now. Thank you very much, Doctor. Doctor uh, Bedusa Kordia is in charge of uh, surveillance at the Ghana Health Service. Let's move on to something else. Education, maybe. Many school children in the Upper East region have been forced by their own parents to migrate down south, south during holidays to do menial jobs to support their families. A practice which has been condemned as a violation of their rights. To help the children understand these rights, Africa's Ghana, a child rights centered non governmental organization, is sponsoring the formation of child rights clubs in some big schools which culminated in the annual child rights festival at Bogotanga in the Upper East region. Here's a report that was sent in by Albert Sori. Children from the Talensi and Namdam districts, Bogotanga Municipal and the Kasana Nankana districts participated in the Africa's Child Rights Festival. The program was organized to help the children learn about their rights through cultural performances as well as big quiz and spelling bee competitions. The children were awarded exercise books, pens, novels and given other educational materials for their various schools for participating in the festival. The Africa's Child Rights Festival will now be held annually. David Paula is the director of programs at Africa's Ghana. For 
high rates of child abuse. For instance, child labor is very high within the region. Forced and uh, child marriage is, is also quite high. We are also aware that in this same region, we still have issues of child, children migrating down south, seeking greener pastures. In an attempt to deal with all these situations, that we believe that it is important for us to uh, mobilize the children who are in school, encourage them to continue to be in school, and encouraging them to learn alongside or knowing what their rights are so that they can uh, protect their rights and also know even where to go to in an event that the right of the child is trampled upon. Some of the participants spoke about the benefits of the festival. I have gained so many things in, in this one because when I was in school and this program was not organized, I was not having the confidence and even the leadership skills, I was not having them. But for the sake of this program, in fact, I can go to public which people are more than this and I'll still be able to perform work. Well. This program has, has helped me because I'm a, a final year student. If I'm to write and I think if I need this type of topic in Wai, I'm not going to panic. I'll write it and come out with excitement. This program has helped me a lot. By the time this is my year I'm going to complete. But I don't even know something concerning debate. By this program it has helped me a lot by now if you're questioning us in debate. I don't think I'll I will choose a different thing apart from better writing. Albert Sorry's report from Bogatanga. And our Deputy Defence Minister Ebenezer Tay Labi has warned troops serving in peace missions abroad could be exposed to attacks due to Parliament's failure to approve a $300 million loan on Monday. Now, this loan agreement between Government of Ghana and VTD Capital PLC, Russian bank based in UK, is aimed at procuring logistics and equipment for personnel of the Ghana Army for effective peacekeeping missions in South Sudan and Mali. However, disagreements over aspects of the loan agreement have stalled the process in Parliament. Telephone by Deputy Defence Minister Ebenezer Taylor. Thank you very much, Ebenezer, for joining us here on News Today. We have. Do I have Ebenezer? Hello. Right. Uh, so, you, you think this would affect peacekeeping missions abroad? Why so? Because we need equipment to go with. Mm. You don't, you don't, well, we have the soldiers, we have the men over there. But they need some equipment to be, to be able to uh, perform their, their functions as soldiers on the field. Tell us what this $300 million loan was supposed to procure for our men. They are, you know, we are, we are going to put them into, uh, the, uh, we are going to buy military equipment or military equipment. Hello? Hello? Right. I, I was, I was, I was, I was, for the soldiers. Mm, I was equipment. hoping you, you could elaborate on that. Oh, they call them platforms. Military platforms. I see. What do these yeah. military platforms do for our men? Let's, 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 let's try and speak the everyday grammar in, in, instead of the military grammar. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, as a soldier, you need, to, you need to be in uniform, you need to have your gun, you need to have ammunition, you need a vehicle, you understand, for your pressure. These are the things that we are going to buy. Mm. They also need to be trained before they go. You need some, you know, training before you embark on uh, the piece of pressure. You understand? So these are the things that we need the money for. I, 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 I can assume that you are not particularly enthused about the back and forth over this agreement in Parliament. No. Oh, well, I don't, I don't really understand what you mean by back and forth. It's just a simple process. You know, we, we uh, take a loan agreement to Parliament involves, you know, various stages. We have gotten to a certain stage and uh, we are being asked to, uh, to do something, you know, the finance people say they need some time to do, you know, due diligence. So we have to give them time. Let them, I hope that when we come back, it's going to be approved for us to have, you know, uh, the money for our men. But there, there has been disagreement over aspects of uh, the, the agreement. And, th and that's what I meant by the back and forth. 
I was hoping, I was hoping, if, if you could comment on that quickly, then we, we could move on. Back and forth. Well, I don't really understand what you're saying because uh, uh, the paper was late, you know, the agreement was late, it was given to the committee, the committee has done its work, but then we did not have the opportunity to uh, 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 pass it. So we would have to wait when we reconvene, then, you know, uh, 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 that's going to be done. I see. Now, since some concerns were raised about the bank we were dealing with, some concerns were raised about some of the terms within the agreement. Who, who said that? Well, I have not heard that yet. Who said that? I see. That? I see. Was it a committee level or, you know, you had some snippets of information from somewhere? I, 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 were you listening on the proceedings yesterday in Parliament? Sorry? Right, let's, let's, let's move away briefly from that. And so in the... Yeah, the I was, I'm, a, I'm a member of parliament. I was, I, was, I was in parliament yesterday. Right, and, and well, if, if, if you still insist... The point is that, yes, you see, the point is that we had it on our uh, program yesterday. Yes, that, yes. But it was not discussed on the floor of parliament. I see. Let's, let's move away briefly from that. Now, it, it, okay. how... how Quickly, do our men that need this money? How soon do they need it? As soon as it's available. We need it. Because our men, we have already committed some men in South Sudan. We need to send another 500. We have our men in, in Mali. We have our men in Cote d'Ivoire. We have our men in the Middle East. And we need to resource them to be able to perform. I see. We'll leave it here for now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Ebenezer Taylor is Deputy Defense Minister. You're watching news today. There's more ahead. Don't go away. Now you're welcome back to news today. A researcher at the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, Professor J.K. Abo, has made a strong case for nuclear energy as an option for Ghana's unstable energy system. He was speaking at a public lecture organized by the Graduate Students Association of the University of Ghana, Lega. Well, let's move away from that quickly. And uh, news coming in is that the Monetary Policy Committee has maintained the policy rate at 18%. My colleague, Abigail Adumako Inchi, was there for us. She joined us over the telephone. Hello, Abigail. Hello, are you? Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, what went into uh, the decision? Hello, Kamini. I'm asking, what went into the decision to maintain the policy rate? Hello, are you? I think we lost Abigail there. We we'll would get back to her and then understand the MPC stands on maintaining the policy rate at 18%. Now, the West Africa Contracts Monitoring Network is asking governments not to sign on to new social contracts without securing the needed funds to prevent those projects from stalling. The network also called on civil society organizations to consistently monitor the procurement processes and contracts of government to make them transparent and accountable. To effectively monitor and improve governance in national public procurement and contracting processes and outcomes, the World Bank established a West Africa Contract Monitoring Network, WACOM, in 2010. WACOM, after embarking on a two-year project to build capacity and monitor the procurement processes and execution of some key contracts in Ghana, Nigeria, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, observed that the projects have stalled, particularly due to lack of funds. In Ghana, the coalition led by the Ghana Integrity Initiative monitored road construction, the Lateshi Road and the Asimprasu Road. So when you compare the Lateshi Road to the road they monitored in the central region, the Asimprasu Road, that road is Japanese government funded. And I can assure you, when we went on that road, you could see that work has been done. It was going on. It's only because the Japanese had money and supporting the, the project. So it went on quickly. So if you compare the two, you could see that there's a problem when government, you know, commits to uh, projects that it does not have the needed funding. So we think that is a problem. And as we have drawn attention, we are hoping that this will be able to be um, 
addressed by government in future. The World Bank, which offered over $100,000 for the project, pledged its continuous support. Social accountability mechanisms, as you know, um, the range of them out there, uh, participatory budgeting, performance monitoring, participatory expenditure tracking, there are a range of them that some of you are involved in, do play a crucial role in the demand for good governance. And that agenda is increasingly, you know, getting um, a lot of focus from the bank. Um, the whole notion of citizen engagement is becoming critical in the development agenda. And so this is a piece of that work. And so we are increasingly going to be focusing attention on providing support for civil society. Acting Director of Public Prosecutions, Cynthia Lamte, deputizing the Minister of Justice and Attorney General lauded the Wakam project and indicated that while government is implementing a number of commitments on ensuring transparency and accountability in governance, there are several challenges they need to overcome. We need to change people's attitudes and behaviors towards politics and government. By changing their behaviors from one of patron client to one of active citizenship will take time, especially since patrons resist any move that can diminish or take their powers away. Another challenge we are facing is that until now, the change in civil society's perspectives on constructive engagement is still limited. We need to move from critical collaboration to collaborative engagement if we truly want social accountability to work. She, however, mentioned that governments will incorporate the lessons from the Wakam project to ensure greater social accountability and constructive engagement with state authorities. The news coming in, the Monetary Policy Committee has maintained the policy rate at 18%. Abigail Adumaku, and she was there for us. She's joined us over the telephone. Hello, Abigail. Hello, Kamini. What went into this decision? Yeah, a, a lot of factors, actually. Uh, the Monetary Policy Committee uh, looked at the challenges that the economy is facing right now. They took into consideration the utility tariffs that, um, you know, the high utility tariffs that we are paying as consumers and the energy challenges that we are having. And also inflation, uh, for them, the risk, so high inflation is so high, so they decided to maintain the policy rate at 18 uh, percent. Notwithstanding that, they took into consideration the sentiments of businesses and even consumers, looking at the challenges that uh, the economy is facing. It's really affecting consumers, and, and so um, increasing the policy rate would go a long way to affect businesses and consumers, so they decided to maintain the rate at 18 percent. But away from that, um, the Bank of Ghana not too long ago in, instituted or introduced uh, the forex measures and they said that the measures are really working for them because the depreciation of the city, you know, has started slowing down and they are hopeful that uh, by the end of the year, uh, the city uh, would have stabilized. But they maintain that um, there are still vulnerabilities um, in the system. And so in the next three months, if the measures um, have any effect on the economy, they would have to review it. But for now, it's too early for them to review their measures as uh, some you know, civil society groups are calling for. And also there are ch some challenges um, in the global economic outlook, looking at the tapering in the U.S. and the crisis in Ukraine currently, and also the uh, slowdown in China, they believe that if it persists, it will trickle down to our domestic economy. So a lot of issues you know, surrounding the global um, economy and the domestic economy as well. Mm. One of the issues still to be addressed had to do with the forex measures they are put in place, like you mentioned, to arrest the free fall of, of the city. Concerns raised with those measures, where they are addressed? Exactly so, Kemini. Uh, what the governor is saying is that it's too early to review these measures. Um, a lot of uh, businesses 
maintain that the measures are market unfriendly, others to think that they are working. So the Bank of Ghana is saying that we should look at both sides of the point. It's just too early for them to do any reviews. In the next three months, they would look at um, reviewing it if it's not working as they expect it to work. They admit that there are still some vulnerabilities in the system. And so they are also working at um, stabilizing the economy and making sure that the fundamentals are right. Because all these challenges are arising from the fundamentals of the economy, which we, we all understand that is weak. But the Bank of Ghana is saying that they are really working uh, together with government to make sure that they get the fundamentals right. We live in here. See you soon. Abigail Adam and Kuinchi joined us from the Bank of Ghana. We'll bring you more on this in subsequent broadcasts. Uh, let's move on to something else. And General Motors Chief Executive Mary Barra has apologized for an ignition switch port in some cars linked to at least a dozen deaths in road crashes. At a U.S. congressional hearing on Tuesday, she said she was... By the, she was disturbed by the company's previous comments about the high cost of replacing the defective parts. General Motors has so far recalled 2.6 million cars because of the defects, but it has been criticized for taking too long to do so. Let's get into us and entertainment and did you know that the shoes you wear convey a thin but useful slice of information about your personality? Well, the old adage says glory not found on the face can be seen on one's feet. Showbiz talks shoes today. It's often said that dress as you want to be addressed and your choice of shoes really spell out a chunk of your personality whenever you step out in public. Strangers can tell a lot about you just by checking out your footwear. At least, that is according to researchers from the University of Kansas and Wellesley College. A young Ghanaian entrepreneur, Tony Senaya, who has found the inspiration to go into shoemaking and the brand name Husband Shoes, shares a few tips on what to consider when choosing those pair of shoes. Uh, normally, comfort, mm. comfort should, should be your priority before you look at style, and the nature of your of your foot should also inform you the type of shoes that you want. Some people w wear pointy shoes; for them, it defines their personality. Okay. okay, but if you have broad, if you have broad foot, you cannot wear pointy shoes. Okay. You have to wear what they call dog mouth or um, a shoe with a very broad front. Uh, how about the men? What should they really look out for? I mean, comfort is one. Then, but I, I think that there are some set of shoes that every man should have in their closet. Okay. One, you have, you must have a lace shoe. Normally, when people want to do weddings, I recommend that if they are wearing suits, they wear lace up shoes because it makes the formality complete. Oh, okay. You must have a sweet shoe that you wear on certain occasions. Mm -hmm. Then you must have um, a loafer. Mm -hmm. Then very important one brown shoe mm -hmm. even if you are not a fan of brown, brown shoes you must have one brown why? shoe why um you never know i mean j just for a change it it adds color okay. black black is boring so i mm -hmm. think that at times we must make life colorful ourselves yeah, yeah. according to tony husband's shoes is known for its modern and futuristic designs and it aims at providing patrons quality and affordable shoes that are durable he is launching the 2014 collection, which features executive and casual shoes, sandals and flats designed for anybody who likes to wear shoes and other quality footwear this month. Thank you very much for staying to the uh, Let's check out our headlines again. And Judgment Dead Soul Commissioner Justice Yao Apao calls for effective supervision of state atten attorneys. Find more news on myjoinline.com. My name is Kemini Nyamani Amana. Goodbye.